When, after defeating the attempt by the Red Army to capture Kharkov, the Germans launched their own summer offensive in late June 1942, Luftwaffe strength included the last DO 17Z serving in the bomber role, flown by the Croat volunteer staff of KG 53. Given the title Case Blue by Hitler, the German plan envisaged a two pronged assault by the Wehrmacht into southern Russia. Sixth Army, under the command of von Paulus, were to advance on and capture Stalingrad. The Second Army group was to capture Rostov on Don and then advance southwards into the Caucasus to capture the vital oil fields in the region. At first, the German drive stormed ahead, but in the confusion over priorities lay the foundation for subsequent defeat. By late August, Stalingrad seemed about to fall. By 1942, the task of battlefield and medium-range tactical reconnaissance in the Luftwaffe on the Eastern Front had been taken over almost completely by Focke-Wulf's twin-boom FW-189. Named the OWL, its large expanse of glazing housing the crew in the small fuselage section saw it quickly nicknamed the Flying Eye. The 189 rapidly proved itself to be highly effective providing intelligence not just of local enemy dispositions for the benefit of artillery and Stukas, but also of longer range targets employed for planning the raids of the medium bombers. The heavy losses of bombers in the previous summer and winter in Russia saw their role in theater as providing support for army operations in the summer of 1942 become even more pronounced. Thus, the few surviving DO-17s, in addition to the JU-88s and HE-111s, found themselves being employed even more as flying artillery in the Crimea and in the southern drive towards the Caucasus oil fields and eastwards to the River Volga. During the early summer, JU-88s operating with von Richthofen's 8th Flieger Corps were flying up to four bombing sorties a day from bases barely 10 minutes flying time from the city of Sevastopol which was under attack by von Manstein's 11th Army. This intensity of operations also became the norm for bomber units supporting the attempt by 6th Army to take the city of Stalingrad throughout the late summer and autumn of 1942. Although the activities of Rommel's Afrika Corps was to generate good copy for the cameraman of the propaganda department, North Africa was never regarded as anything but a subsidiary theater of operations by Hitler. His initial commitment of German forces had been dictated by his need to prop up the Italians rather than from any desire to see German forces involved in the region. Nevertheless, once made, Rommel's forces needed air support. While fighters and Stukas supported the ground forces in the fighting in Libya, the bomber units found themselves tasked with the reduction of the island fortress of Malta. The strategic importance of Malta to the RAF and the Royal Navy can be gauged by the losses their air and sea units inflicted on Axis shipping, taking supplies across the Mediterranean from Italy to North Africa during the last months of 1941. In September, 38% of all shipping dispatched was sunk. In October, 63% and in November, 77%. Such losses could not be accepted and in the absence of adequate Italian forces, Hitler had little choice but to send air forces to the region to neutralize the island. In October, 1941, Luftflotte II arrived in Sicily to join the 10th Air Corps, which had been operating from bases on the island since the previous December. 10th Air Corps had deployed a large number of JU-88 formations under its umbrella. These had included Staffel from KGs 54 and 77, Camphor Group 806 and LG-1. A number of these formations were then transferred to Russia in mid-1941, leaving LG-1 to bear the brunt of JU-88 ops in this theatre through to 1944. Bombing raids against British convoys were launched, as were attacks on the island itself. These had some effect for, by January 1942, Axis shipping losses had fallen to 20%. April 1942 saw the beginning of a large-scale Axis bombing campaign against Malta. Ultimately, the bombing offensive against Malta was to come to naught due to Hitler's reluctance to order the invasion of the island. 
Elements of LG-1 also found itself involved in the direct support of Rommel's forces in North Africa. Night attacks were launched by bomber units operating against British supply lines and flew with others operating out of bases in Greece and Crete to attack the Canal Zone and in particular the port of Alexandria. By the time this film was taken in mid-1942, the growth of the Desert Air Force had made it difficult for the HE-111 and the Ju-88 to operate in daylight. An outgrowth of the earlier DO-17Z, the improved Dornier DO-217E, entered service with the Luftwaffe in 1941, first seeing action with KG-40 in the anti-shipping role. Shortly thereafter, it entered service with KG-2, which in fact became the only bomber wing to be totally equipped on the type. Operating out of bases in Holland, KG-2 thus became the cutting edge of the Luftwaffe bomber force in the West, DO-217s of 2 KG-2 first participating with the aircraft of KG-40 in night raids on London in July 1941. Through the rest of 1941 and throughout 1942, 217s were used extensively over the British Isles, raiding targets as far afield as Hull through to Exeter. They were the principal type used in the so-called Baedeker raids. Losses, both to crashes and interceptions by increasingly sophisticated RAF night fighters, rose substantially during this period. The type was subjected to intensive testing throughout its development and subsequent combat career. Having its origin in a 1937 Luftwaffe specification, it is interesting how testing of the early prototypes included the requirement that the 217 be able to undertake dive bombing. It was thus equipped with an unusual tail-mounted cruciform dive brake that was not, however, proceeded with. Further development of the 217 led to the emergence of the K and M models. Both shared the same fuselage and wing arrangement. The defining feature of these new models was the extensively glazed nose, similar to that used on the HE-177. The principal distinguishing feature between the two was retention of the BMW radials on the K and use of Daimler-Benz inlines on the M. Both were used for night bombing, but neither was built in great numbers. Film of the DO-217 engaged in combat missions is extremely rare. Even rarer is footage of the K and M variants. In this sequence, a 217K is seen taking off on a mission in Russia. This was unusual in that very few of the type served there. Although the strength of the Red Air Force had not yet driven Luftwaffe bombers from the sky in daylight, the specialized role of the 217K as a night bomber found it being employed to attack important Soviet targets by night in the run-up to the summer offensive of Kursk in July 1943. Having been thrown back beyond the start line of their previous summer's offensive by a Red Army that had run rampant since surrounding and destroying the 6th Army at Stalingrad, the Germans now began their own counter-offensive to regain the initiative in southern Russia. Recovering from the disarray that had afflicted German air operations since December, the Luftwaffe High Command was able to assist Field Marshal von Manstein in the provision of air support for his counter-offensive. By the time the German attack began on February the 19th, OKL had moved significant air assets southwards to reinforce Luftflot 4 under the command of Luftwaffe Field Marshal von Richthofen. Thus, by the time Manstein's mobile forces had begun their assault on the overextended Soviet formations driving hard for the river to Dnieper, Richthofen had, under his command, some 950 aircraft. This corresponded to 53% of all Luftwaffe assets serving in the east. Ever since his experiences in Spain, Richthofen had emerged as one of the foremost Luftwaffe practitioners of close air support. He 
now wielded the aircraft units under his command, including the medium bomber Staffel, so that they became totally responsive to the needs of the ground forces. The HE-111s, JU-88s and declining numbers of DO-17s available to him thus became even more identified with their employment as flying artillery, their targets in many cases being retreating Soviet columns or villages turned into well-defended positions by the Red Army. In the face of such a rapidly changing battlefield situation, photo intelligence of the movement and disposition of enemy forces became a priority. FW-189s of the recce units were extensively employed in the short to medium range surveillance of the battlefield to garner the information required by Luftwaffe staff planning the next sorties. Very close contact was therefore necessary with the rapidly advancing ground units and, in the absence of radio, the Fiesler Stork was frequently used to take orders to the front line and carry information about forthcoming Luftwaffe operations. The Stork was a highly regarded type. Although the medium bombers did not move from one airfield to another quite so frequently as did Stuka and Schlachtflieger units, under von Richthofen's direction, this offensive saw them doing so much more than usual. In order to maximize their use, he wished all of his assets to be as near to the moving front line as possible to ensure a high sortie turnaround. Tightly controlling his air assets from Manstein's headquarters at Zaporoshi, the Luftwaffe realized 1,000 sorties per day between 20th of February and the 15th of March in support of the army, compared to the January average of 350 per day. This offensive was to provide the last occasion on which the Luftwaffe was able to provide such effective close support to the army as it did in the days of the Blitzkrieg. The tangible results of this very close cooperation between the ground forces and the Luftwaffe came on March the 10th when Hitler visited von Manstein's headquarters. The field marshal was able to tell Hitler that since the beginning of the counteroffensive, 600 Soviet tanks and 500 guns had been destroyed and the recapture of Kharkov was now in sight. For the poor ground crews keeping the bombers flying in the face of such high sortie rates, the conditions that they were forced to endure when carrying out essential maintenance were appalling. Few of the airfields used were purpose-built and in the absence of hangars, major equipment changes, such as the replacement of this engine on a Ju-88, had to be carried out in the open, come blizzards, intense frosts, and severe temperatures as low as 30 to 50 degrees below zero. Quite often, the appalling weather prevented the arrival of supplies and spares, and on many occasions, replacing an engine meant cannibalizing another aircraft that had been badly damaged to provide the necessary spares to enable another to be returned to service. It is small wonder that many Luftwaffe pilots, when talking about their own exploits, have made frequent warm references to the valiant efforts of the black men in keeping their aircraft flying, whatever the circumstances. A sudden rise in temperature in the days following the 10th of March had brought the German advance to a halt in floundering mud and raised the fear of a forced and premature end to the counter-offensive. However, the rapid return of freezing weather once more turned the earth back into iron, allowing the SS Panzer Corps and Army mobile formations to resume their chase of the retreating Soviet forces and the advance on Kharkov. As the German forces approached Kharkov, Luftwaffe bombers began to concentrate their attacks on the supply lines of the Red Army units in the city and beyond. As the fourth city of the Soviet Union, Kharkov was the nexus for numerous railway lines. Those coming from the east were used to rail in supplies and weapons into the city, which Stalin did not wish to see fall again.
coming in at low level, these HE-111s attack one of the marshalling yards in the city. The snowy landscape over which they are flying is crisscrossed by Soviet tank tracks. No film better perhaps exemplifies the manner in which during this operation the medium bombers were employed almost as ground attack aircraft than this sequence. The nose gunner of this HE-111 employs his machine gun to strafe a goods train. Soviet soldiers can be seen running for cover. Raids beyond Kharkov also saw the medium bomber Stafon attacking Soviet positions across the frozen river Donets and deep within the Kursk salient. On the 11th of March, an SS division began to enter the western outskirts of the city. Two other SS divisions headed for the north and west of Kharkov, in effect sealing it off on its eastern side. There now began three very bloody days of fighting as the SS troops swept through the city against fiercely determined Soviet resistance. With the fall of the city, all Soviet resistance west of the river Donets collapsed and Manstein declared his operation complete on the 17th of March. In June 1943, the Luftwaffe cut their losses and cancelled the Bomber B programme. Ongoing since 1939, this was to emerge as the most costly failure undertaken by the German Air Force. Tasked with creating a Ju-88 replacement, Junkers built the Ju-288 which saw extensive development through many variants, none of which were ever satisfactory. Nor was the competing FW191 any better. Both designs were extremely advanced, but embraced many technical innovations and new engines that never performed adequately. It is remarkable that a heavy bomber with a production run of nearly 600 machines spread over a period of three years should nevertheless have been regarded by almost all who had anything to do with it as an abject failure. That indeed was the lot of Heinkel's HE-177 Grief. Born out of a late 30s specification to provide the Luftwaffe with a long-range heavy bomber, its development was stymied by persistent engine problems. Contrary to appearance, the type was actually a four-engine design, but the Daimler-Benz engines were coupled, each driving one propeller, giving the impression that it was a twin-engine type. While pilots reported that the handling and performance of this large aircraft were fine, these qualities were negated by the alarming and very frequent tendency of the engines to catch fire in flight. Nor was the development of such a large aircraft in its early stages helped by the ludicrous requirement that it also be able to function as a dive bomber. The first production model, designated the HE-177A1, entered service in the summer of 1942 with KG-40 in France, but was not a success. The HE-177s of 1 KG-50 were rushed eastwards to serve as transports flying into Stalingrad, nor were they a success. In the meantime, the 177A3 had entered production and left it to be replaced by the A5 variant in February 1943. Seen here undergoing maintenance are the coupled Daimler-Benz engines on an HE-177A5 belonging to KG-40. Film of operational HE-177s is non-existent, the only footage remaining of the type showing the testing of the prototypes. In spite of the difficulties with the aircraft, development of new variants spawned many sub-types, differing one from another in terms of armament and role. One of the immediate solutions to the 177's power plant problems would have been to have given it four separated engines. Heinkel's proposal to do exactly this was met with indifference, irritation and downright bloody-mindedness. When finally flown with four separated engines, it had to be given the code designation HE-177BO because Goering had forbidden Heinkel to speak of it. HE-177s nevertheless saw combat in 1944. 35 HE-177s were used to bomb England during Operation Steinbock. It was also used in Russia. Referred to under the programme cover name of Large Salmon, 
The development of anti-shipping missiles was a major innovation by the Germans in the Second World War. Of the two types developed, the most employed in combat was the HS-293, an example of which is seen here being mounted on the underside of a Heinkel 111 for testing purposes. The second anti-shipping weapon was known as the Fritz X, but unlike the HS-293, was an unpowered radio-guided bomb. It had to be released from a much higher altitude than the 293. The origin of the HS-293 missile came in 1939 when a Dr. Herbert Wagner produced designs which were employed by the Henschel company to create their remote control gliding bomb. In the following year, steps were taken to develop prototypes and much work was carried out on radio control systems. By May 1940, the first airborne tests were planned, employing a modified HE-111 as a carrier aircraft. Unguided tests preceded the first remote controlled firings. The second of these is seen here in this film. Having been launched, the missile is guided towards the target by the observer using a joystick. This transmitted signals to the missile which controlled its passage through the air. The test was considered a success. Nineteen forty three saw the HS two nine three deployed on HE one one sevens with KG forty in the anti shipping role operating out of Bordeaux Merignac. It could carry up to three missiles. The impact of a strike by an HS two nine three on a ship can be seen in this film of a firing of one of the missiles against a six thousand ton vessel employed as a target off the coast of Pomerania in the spring of nineteen forty one. It illustrates the primary limitation of the system in the requirement that the launch aircraft fly straight and level to enable the missile director to observe the flares on the rear of the weapon. It was by this means that he knew how to direct it onto its target. Such a flight path rendered the carrier plane totally vulnerable to attack from enemy fighters and anti-aircraft fire, as was indeed the case. The long span 217K2 was specially developed to enable it to carry either the HS293 or the Fritz X, although the earlier DO217E4 was able to carry a single HS293 on an outer wing pylon. Although the Junkers company had carried out extensive preliminary work on an improved JU88B quite early on, the great success of the JU88A series and the assumption that by 1942-43 it would be replaced by the Bomber B had seen it sidelined. The very obvious failure of the latter and the need to supplement and replace the JU-88 led to the 88B providing the basis of the JU-188. This new type entered service with one KG-6 in May 1943. Powered by BMW radials or UMO inlines, the distinguishing features of this aircraft were its bulbous all-glass nose and the pointed outer wing panels. Apart from conventional bombing, the JU-188 also saw service as a torpedo bomber in northern Norway, attacking Allied convoys sailing to Murmansk. It also served, as seen here, as a long-range reconnaissance type. The particular mission being flown is a photographic sortie over Bucharest after the Romanian government had changed sides and allied themselves to the Russians. Just over 1,000 JU-188s were built before production ended. Although German forces had been defeated in their attempt to capture the Caucasus oil fields during their summer offensive in 1942, Hitler had insisted that a bridgehead be retained in the Kuban. His intention was that once the military situation elsewhere in Russia had been satisfactorily resolved, German forces would employ this bridgehead, called the Goths Head, to launch a further offensive to secure the oil fields. By mid-1943, the area was the scene of very fierce fighting on the ground and in the air. Heavy air battles saw the commitment of substantial German bomber forces. 
The yellow paint applied to the edge of the engine cowling on this JU-88A4 and the Idlewise emblem on the nose marks these aircraft out as belonging to the third staffel of KG-51. The A4 was the most produced of all the variants of the JU-88 series. Indeed, so numerous was the A4 that by the end of 1942, the 520 in service constituted nearly half of all the bombers on strength with the bombing arm of the Luftwaffe. While weapons or fuel tanks could be carried on four external racks mounted on the wing between the fuselage and engine nacelles, those in this film are carrying their bomb load in the internal bay. On July the 5th, 1943, the Germans launched their offensive to destroy the Kursk salient in Russia. Although primarily known for being the arena for the greatest tank battle in history, the air war over the Kursk salient was every bit as vicious and extensive as the ground combat. For Operation Zittertel, the Luftwaffe had made great efforts to concentrate as many formations as could be spared. Indeed, the Eastern Front was stripped to provide the fighter and bomber units necessary to give the army the very comprehensive air support it would need to defeat the most powerful defences the Red Army had ever created. In total, some 1,200 medium bombers were concentrated under the 4th and 6th Air Fleets. Supporting 4th Panzer Army in the south of the salient were the 1st and 3rd Gruppen of KG-3 flying JU-88s and the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Gruppen of KGs 27 and 55 flying HE-111s. To the north of the salient, tasked with supporting Modell's 9th Army were the 2nd and 3rd Gruppen of KG-51 employing JU-88s and 4 Gruppen of KGs 4 and 53 operating HE-111s. In the weeks prior to July the 5th, these bomber formations had been extensively employed in attacking Soviet airfields, both real and false, bombing railway lines and supply routes. They also undertook long-range attacks on Soviet armament works at Gorky and Yaroslav. Once the offensive had begun, however, most of the Ju-88 and HE-111 formations found themselves employed as flying artillery to help demolish the vast fortifications of bunkers and deep trench lines that formed the basis of the Soviet defense system. Given the close proximity of many of the airfields to the actual battlefield, the bomber Gruppen found themselves flying many sorties per day in support of the ground forces. In spite of the massive sortie rate and numbers of aircraft employed by the Luftwaffe, the Soviet defences did not cave in, and as the battle lengthened, the strength of the Soviet Air Force became more and more apparent. German estimates of the strength of the Soviet air power were as much in error as their estimates of their tank strength. With a total of nearly 3,000 combat types deployed for the battle, the Soviets were able to wrest control of the air from the Luftwaffe in a number of sectors. The deployment of a new generation of Soviet fighters over the salient also made the operations of the bomber units increasingly difficult. The Yak-9 and LA-5FN were more than a match for the German fighters, and numbers of JU-88s and HE-111s were lost to these types. Although the Germans threw extremely powerful forces against the Soviet defences, they did not crack. By the 13th of July, the chances of the Germans breaking through to Kursk from either the north or south was no longer possible. Losses were increasing, and just a few days before, the Allies had landed in Sicily. In the north, the Soviets had already gone over to the counter-offensive, and Luftwaffe units now found themselves being employed to attack advancing Soviet tank formations in the Orel salient. Although Manstein's forces in the south continued to make progress, the possibility of a major breakthrough had now totally receded. Hitler decided to cut his losses and call off Zittertal, for he was concerned to see ground and air assets transferred forthwith to Italy and Germany. Within a fortnight, the Soviets had launched a long plan for counteroffensive in the south, and within days, the Germans had to relinquish all territory captured since July the 5th.
Many bombers were used by high-ranking Army and Air Force officers as personal transports. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel is seen here arriving in his HE-111 at Salonika in Greece on July the 25th, 1943, where he was due to make an inspection tour, as it was believed at the time that the Allies would attempt a landing there. Field Marshal Albert Kesselring employed a DO-217M. Long-range reconnaissance over the Med was carried out by JU-88Ds of the Alf Klarungsgruppen. Having returned from a sortie, the photographs of an Allied convoy have been quickly developed and are studied by the pilots in preparation for an anti-shipping sortie. Details of ship types are studied so as to work out the appropriate tactics to assault the convoy. Naval vessels are of particular concern because of anti-aircraft fire. From November 1942, with the launch of Operation Torch, through to July 1943 and the invasion of Sicily, followed by the Salerno landings in September, Luftwaffe anti-shipping units were heavily involved in strikes on Allied convoys. Their difficulties were compounded by the loss of most of the Italian torpedo squadrons following Italy's withdrawal from the war. The Allies landed on the mainland of Italy at Salerno, where very fierce fighting took place. However, a number of pro-fascist units continued to operate their aircraft alongside the German formations. The heavy fighting at Salerno was to be a foretaste of the bitter warfare that would be waged in the peninsula as the Germans made a slow fighting retreat to the north. Seen being briefed by their commander, Major Klumper, are pilots of KG-26, one of the Luftwaffe bomber formations specializing in anti-shipping strikes. By August 1943, aircraft from his formation had sunk 32 vessels in the Mediterranean. Equipped mainly with HE-111s, wearing the Velen Muster camouflage scheme, the aircrew make ready for their sortie, assisted by their canine companions. This operation involves a mixed force of German aircraft and Italian SM-79 Siliranti trimotor bombers, a number of which have been crewed by German pilots. While shown to German cinema audiences after the Allied landings at Salerno and the Italian armistice with the Allies, the actual film of the attack on the Allied convoy predates these events. German and Italian aircraft were able to operate in mixed formation because of the similarity in operational procedures. Most, if not all, of the German pilots having been trained in the art of aerial torpedo dropping at the Italian Air Force School at Grosseto. The SM-79 Spaveros had acquired a formidable reputation in this role, as was attested by the Royal Navy, who had often been on the receiving end of their expertise. Whereas the HE-111 could lift two torpedoes for a sortie, the SM-79 normally carried just one. The period after the Salerno landings also marks attacks on Allied convoys by Dorniers carrying anti-ship missiles. Once Allied fighters became based on the Italian mainland and were able to offer air cover to shipping off the Italian coast, it became much more difficult for the Germans to mount the sort of operations seen here. What little film was taken of Luftwaffe bombers in action on the Eastern Front after the Battle of Kursk, more often than not, shows Heinkel 111s being employed more and more frequently in the transport role. On this occasion, towards the end of the winter of 1943-44, late model HE-111s have been loaded with under-fuselage air-droppable containers to fly a supply mission to the encircled German garrison at Covell in western Bielorussia. These HE-111s carry the powered gun turret on the upper fuselage and a cannon in the nose cone. The supply containers are para-dropped over Covell, which was under heavy fire from Soviet artillery. The lack of Soviet fighters to contest this para-drop is remarkable given that the HE-111s are without escort protection and would be extremely vulnerable to enemy fighter attack. 
In 1944, the United States and the Soviet Union came to an agreement whereby U.S. heavy bombers and escort fighters of the 15th Air Force operating out of bases in Italy would be able to fly on through to bases in Russia after bombing targets in eastern Germany. The Soviet Air Force made air bases at Poltava, Mirgorod and Pyriatin available for the B-17s and their Mustang escorts. In June 1944, bombers and fighters of the 8th Air Force operating out of England took their place. Until the night of June the 21st, the Luftwaffe had done little to impede the progress of the US bomber stream as it flew eastward over Poland. But on that occasion, a Ju-88 trailed the US formation of 163 B-17s and photographed them as they landed at Poltava and Mirgorod. The decision was taken by the Luftwaffe to mount a night attack on the US bombers. Led by the Pathfinders from KG-4, 200 111s from KGs 4, 53 and 55, drawn from Flieger Corps 4, took off from airfields in Poland to attack the two bases. Heavy cloud over Mirgorod saw all bombers concentrate on Poltava, dropping flares and high explosives. This is the only picture taken of the Poltava raid in progress. Of the 72 forts on the airfield, 44 were destroyed and 26 damaged. A dump of 400,000 gallons of aviation fuel was also destroyed. Although no bomber units attempted to launch raids on the Allied landing beaches in daylight on D-Day itself, in the days following, sorties were flown by Ju-88s and DO-217s of Flieger Corps 9. Targets were initially vessels lying off the coast, but as the Normandy campaign progressed, many harassing night raids were launched on the Allied bridgehead, but with little impact on the outcome of the battle. HS-293 missiles were also launched against ships by DO-217s, but to no avail. By the end of the campaign in Normandy, Luftwaffe bomber losses were catastrophic. One of the more bizarre roles for which the Heinkel 111 was employed was that of a launcher for the V-1 missile. The 20 modified bombers served with the third Staffel of KG-3 flying out of Holland. No fewer than 410 V-1s were launched in this fashion, and these were directed mainly at London, Southampton and Gloucester from July 1944 onwards. In the very last film taken for the newsreel showing Luftwaffe bombers in action, Heinkel 111s are seen acting once more in the transport role. Their task was to supply the many encircled German formations bypassed in Poland as the Red Army advanced to the River Oder in January and February 1945. A number are used as tugs to pull DFS 230 gliders, whose pilots have clearly accepted that they're making a one-way trip into the beleaguered garrisons. Such was the end game played by a bomber arm that had terrorized Europe for the previous five years. In the absence of a large surface fleet denied to Germany under the terms of the Versailles Treaty, there was little need for the small navy Germany was permitted after 1919 to acquire or even develop specialized float planes and flying boats. When the navy needed aircraft, they simply hired them. However, the Nazis' commitment in 1933 to build a new Kriegsmarine saw contracts placed for aircraft to service such a fleet. This survey covers the float planes and flying boats that were used by the Navy and Luftwaffe between 1933 and 1945. The Heinkel HE60 was the first single-engine float plane to see service with the resurrected Kriegsmarine. Seen here being catapulted from the light cruiser Leipzig, the HE60 was employed as a fleet spotter. Although it was well regarded for its handling on water, its slow speed saw its early withdrawal. Only 38 HE-51 floatplane fighters were built, their service life being as limited as film of the type. 
Designed by Arado to replace the HE60, the AR196 was to emerge as one of the best single-engine float planes of the Second World War. First flying in 1936, Trials aircraft tested alternative float arrangements before the twin float design was accepted. The first production variant entered service in 1939, where its fine all-round performance in flight and on the water, allied to a powerful armament, made it very popular with its crews. As with the HE-60, the type was stressed for operation from catapults on the Kriegsmarine's larger warships. In the following sequence, an AR-196 is launched from the battlecruiser Scharnhorst, which, along with its consort, the Gneisenau, is seen operating in the North Sea in early 1939. One of its least publicised activities was its employment in the spotting role by a number of the armed raiders used by the German Navy in the Second World War. Its identity was disguised by its colour scheme and by its lack of national markings. First flying in 1931, the biplane HE-50 was the largest aircraft yet constructed by the firm of Heinkel. Conceived as a multi-role type, the HE-59 was employed for torpedo bombing, naval cooperation and maritime patrol, and could be fitted with either floats or a wheeled undercarriage. When first delivered, the HE-59 was flown in the commercial colours employed by all aircraft serving in the clandestine Luftwaffe until March 1935. Passing through a number of variants, the HE-59 was nevertheless recognised as approaching obsolescence by 1938. With its primary roles due to be transferred to its replacement, the large biplanes received a new lease of life when they were converted into air-sea rescue types. Although designed from the outset to inherit the mantle of its predecessor, the HE-59, Heinkel's new HE-115, was nevertheless obsolescent almost as soon as it took to the air for the first time in August 1937. While undoubtedly elegant, structurally very strong and pleasant to fly, it was nevertheless hampered by its slow speed. In the first production variant, the maximum speed was less than 200 miles an hour. Nevertheless, interest in type from abroad and Germany's need for foreign currency saw the first deliveries going overseas. The HE-115 entered service with the air arms of Denmark, Sweden and Norway in 1939. The first Luftwaffe unit to equip with type was still working up even as war began in September. In German service, the float plane was first employed in the coastal patrol role operating over the Baltic and North Sea and received its baptism of fire during the Norwegian campaign in April 1940. A number of the Norwegian HE-115s escaped destruction by making their way to the UK, where they were later used in secret operations by the SOE, landing agents on the coast of occupied Europe. From May 1940 onwards, Luftwaffe HE-115s, now based in Norway, saw combat over the North Sea, dropping mines and attacking shipping off the coast of northern England. Mines were also dropped in the Thames Estuary and the Bristol Channel by other HE-115s operating out of bases on the coast of France. However, the increasing vulnerability of the type to RAF aircraft like the Bowfighter, operating long-range fighter patrols over the Bay of Biscay, saw the surviving HE-115s transferred from France to northern Norway in late 1941. In this theatre of operations, the HE-115s found themselves serving alongside BV-138s and DO-24s, spotting and attacking British convoys travelling through the Arctic Ocean to Murmansk in Russia, and their operations were attended with greater success. The most eventful of all its sorties was when a number of HE-115s assisted in the destruction of convoy PQ-17 in 1942. Captured on this rare colour film, taken in late 1942, are the anti-aircraft defences of a seaplane base near Tromsø in northern Norway. The protected moorings are home to a number of types, including HE-115s of Kusten Fliegergruppe 906. Pilots and navigators go over their flight plans before climbing into their aircraft for the latest mission. Also seen is a BV-138 passing a moored DO-24. 
Against a backdrop provided by the local mountains, an HE-115C1, mounting an undernose 20mm cannon, accelerates across the waters of the fjord and takes off to begin its mission. The V-138 seen earlier passes overhead, as does the HE-115, which heads seaward to begin its mission. Derived from the earlier DO-15 WAL and designed as its replacement, the Dornier DO-18 saw service with the Luftwaffe between 1936 and August 1941. Although serving in both the short and long-range reconnaissance roles, the slow speed of the type and its poor defensive armament made it extremely vulnerable. Its replacement by the BV-138 saw it transferred to the Air Sea Rescue role where it made way in due course for its successor, the DO-24. Seen in a classic sequence of the type in its specialized role of air-sea rescue is the Dornier DO-24, regarded by those who operated it as a very fine flying boat, it was employed in its allotted role around the seaboard periphery of German-occupied Europe, from northern Norway to the North Sea, from the Bay of Biscay and Atlantic to the Mediterranean and Aegean and Black Sea. For an aircraft that stood so high in Luftwaffe estimation, it is remarkable that the DO-24 was not originally destined for operation by the German service, being designed for and serving in the colours of the Royal Dutch Navy. Only a number of the 60 destined for the Dutch had actually entered service when Holland was overrun in 1940. But it was only when the failings of the HE-59 and DO-18 in the air-sea rescue role became apparent that the Luftwaffe turned to the DO-24 as a readily available substitute. Finding the DO-24 far superior after tests, the type was ordered back into production using the Dutch assembly line. Modified by the inclusion of German instrumentation and a heavy cannon armament, deliveries to the Luftwaffe began in 1941 and continued to 1944. Others were produced in France. Once in service, the DO-24 acquired a reputation as a very rugged type, able to cope with virtually any sea state. Indeed, one account tells of how a Norwegian-based DO-24, having alighted to pick up a downed pilot, lost its complete tail, but managing to stay afloat, used its engines to drive back to base. The most distinctive of all German flying boats was the Blom and Voss BV-138, better known by its nickname of the Flying Clog, awarded to it by virtue of the similarity of its unusual hull form to that of the Dutch shoe. The type was also unusual in employing twin booms for the tailplanes. Although first flown in July 1937, a long gestation period saw its final arrival into service over three years later at the end of 1940. The BV-138 was designed from the outset to be able to be launched from catapults as well as taking off in conventional fashion from the sea. Although operated in the Biscay area, the Mediterranean and Black Sea, the primary theatre of operations for the type was northern Norway, where it served alongside the HE-115 and DO-24. With a range exceeding 3,000 miles, the BV-138 flew far out over the Atlantic and Arctic Oceans, where it was extensively employed to spot and shadow convoys travelling from Britain to Murmansk in northern Russia, carrying Lend-Lease supplies for the Soviet armed forces. One of the more spectacular operations undertaken by the type was in conjunction with U-boats. German High Command, desiring intelligence of the traffic employing the Siberian sea lanes in the summer months, arranged for a number of submarines to be employed as tankers to carry fuel for a few BV-138s. These then operated clandestinely out of the Soviet island of Novaya Zemlya, flying many hundreds of miles along the northern coast of the Soviet Union, returning to the island to refuel. Possessing a heavy armament of cannon and machine guns, the flying clog was able to defend itself relatively well in the face of limited opposition. Shooting down a long-range Blenheim fighter and a Catalina flying boat shortly after beginning service in Norway. Seen in this sequence is one of the rarer operations of convoy protection undertaken by BV-138s 
in conjunction with HE-115s, the latter of which are laying a smoke to shield the ships from an incoming strike by RAF bow fighters and mosquitoes off the coast of Norway. By 1944, the BB-138's slow speed of under 200 miles an hour had led to steep increases in losses. Although originally designed to service a Lufthansa requirement, the military potential of the Blom & Voss BV-222 became readily apparent when it flew for the first time in September 1940. Converted into a transport, the prototype and the other 12 aircraft of the type that were built had the distinction of being the largest flying boats to achieve operational status during the conflict. It was also used on maritime patrol and supporting U-boat operations in the Atlantic. The design of the even larger BV-238 was initiated in 1940 and was from the outset a military aircraft designed to replace the BV-222 in both the transport and maritime patrol roles. A novel, albeit abortive, feature of the design was the attempt to produce a wheeled version of the type for bomber operations. When the prototype of the new flying boat seen here finally took to the air in April 1944, it may not have been the largest aircraft ever flown, but it was certainly the heaviest. This aircraft was to be destroyed at its moorings by strafing Mustangs later in the year. Although other prototypes were building, the program was scrapped. Nevertheless, the BV-238 stands as the foremost example of the varied float and seaplanes to serve with the Luftwaffe under the Third Reich.